Greetings and welcome back to another discussion with the esteemed economist, the uh, gentleman I've had on before, Jio, who uh, is now uh, working in Asia, uh, Singapore, so he's getting a first-hand experience in working economy as opposed to the United States. Or, uh, it's a bad joke, I guess. But uh, today we're going to be talking about inflation. What is inflation? What is the nature of inflation? How it's changed? Because I think there's something really strange um in the current year with regards to inflation and we'll get into that so let me just you know start the conversation by once again welcoming the guest thanks for being here now the strictest definition of inflation is a loss in purchasing power of a currency uh, which itself is a consequence of uh, a surplus or an over, too much currency in, in circulation but th- this this definition seems to largely stem from early 20th century understanding not just understanding but uh, s- monetary systems where actual dollar bills paper money had been printed and and not just in the course of the United States, uh, the phenomenon of the of the wheelbarrow, uh, the the runaway inflation, the Weimar Republic, in the early twentieth century, where people were literally were, you know, wa- walking around the streets with wheelbarrows full of of bills. And more recently, we we've, we've seen it in the Banana Republic of Zimbabwe, to varying degrees, to various degrees. However, in the in the modern Western countries, uh, not Africa. But Europe, where you have the ECB, the European Central Bank, or in the United States, the Federal Reserve, and you know the justification of the Federal Reserve and what they're up to. That I mean, that's a separate discussion. I I want to really just talk about the technicalities here. Uh, it seems, my understanding at least, is that rather than circulating paper currency, when there is an increase in the money supply, what is meant in the current year, in modern terms, is a bunch of digits. That have been punched in on a computer. Now, is that correct? Uh, basically, so the, so the current inflation. Um, and, uh, and by the way, thank you for having me again. My pleasure. Uh, yeah, it's a pleasure for me as well. I mean, it's an honor for me, I suppose. Um, the current uh, situation is a little peculiar in the sense that there is so-called a lot of currency bring, being printed by the central banks. Right. Called typically termed quantitative easing. Yeah, but, but, but almost. Did Bernanke, it, by the way, it, he he coined that during the housing crisis, didn't he? Uh, I think I think it might have been coined by the Bank of Japan about ten years earlier. So okay. okay, I'm not sure so about exactly. So because the Bank of Japan, yeah, the Bank of Japan actually had a quantitative easing program in year 2000 or 2001. Hmm. Um, they they had like QE, QE2, and QQE, a bunch of bunch of those things. Yeah, we uh, kind of run. I think we've run out of the the numbers to attach to the QEs these days. But please yeah, go on. Yeah. Uh, so basically, what happens is um, the central banks, in order when they print money, you know, they, they you can't just have it sitting on your vault. You have to kind of uh, put it out there to the economy. And the way they do that is they usually buy short term U.S. Treasuries. And by by engaging in QE, what's called QE, what 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 it's essentially meant is that they start to buy long-term treasuries, and also uh, mortgage-backed securities mm. uh, in the case of the United States. And in, in Japan, I think they even resorted to buying stocks, even though I think that was a small small part of the central bank portfolio. So so in order, by buying these uh, financial securities, you, you put the money out there. That, that's the goal. Ha, ha, and, and, and like you said... No, it's a brief question. And like you said... It, oh, sorry, go on. Yeah. Um, I don't think we have, I mean, there, there are some economic papers written on this, but we don't have like a good grasp on how it works in general. But what we have seen is that there is a corresponding growth in um, bank reserves. These are commercial banks that, that almost kind of mimic um, the, the amount of money being printed by the central bank. So if you look at the various measures of money supply um, and you take out these uh, reserves. So by reserves, I mean the, usually these commercial banks, they have to put a certain amount of their um, their assets basically in cash in the central banks or otherwise the concern is that if, if you allow them to have no reserves, then they're, they're at risk of a bank run. And in that case, you, you might have a situation where the bank will not be able to pay back its, pay back its depositors. So there's a reserve ratio that banks have to keep. Um, but the issue is that 
after the financial crisis and after quantitative easing, a lot of these banks are keeping an enormous sum of, of money in the central bank. And the central bank, on their hand, is actually paying interest on these on these reserves. So, I mean, there is something in it for, for the commercial banks as well. So I think that's one of the reasons why it feels like you're doing a lot of quantitative easing, but also at the same time, you're not really seeing, you're supposed, when, when a central bank prints that much paper money, you're supposed to see a lot of inflation. I think that's one of, one of the reasons why you're not seeing it. Right, right. And I mean, a couple of comments and as well as a question. I mean, there, yeah. this appears, I guess, the layperson, and I admittedly am somewhat informed in economics, but I am essentially a layperson, to be somewhat mysterious because According to yeah. traditional economic theories, particularly those, particularly those of the Austrian bent, which you know, whole uh -huh. theories were crafted in the 20th century based on some yeah. of the tragic uh, economic uh, policy errors that uh, that occurred uh, during that time. You would think, as you know, you just pointed out that you know, huge increases in the money supply, but we're not seeing, at least in the West, not talking about banana republics here, yeah. uh, the corresponding consequence of runaway inflation of the kind we saw in Weimar Germany. Um, and it, it seems to be quite the case that whatever they're doing, you because you did sort of mention there's a bit of mystery here that yeah. it's not, I mean, they're not doing, the central banks are not doing what they did 100 years ago. Uh, yeah. The processes are clearly different. And and I would, I would have to infer that the, well, the, the mechanics of it as well are different. I mean, obviously they didn't have computers back then. Uh, and and so there, it's it's. I guess what I'm trying to get at is that our, the traditional perception of inflation and understanding might have been spot on in the 1940s and and, and 50s and 30s, 40s and 50s, when, when a guy like uh, Hayek was crafting some of these yeah. ideas. Um, but times have changed, and maybe our understanding of inflation needs to change with that. And I say this because. You had a guy like Peter Schiff. You must know Peter Schiff, right? Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, I stopped yeah. listening to him years ago because uh -huh. after the housing crisis, I just, in the States, I just thought, well, okay, he called that. But, you know, and for a while when I was young, um, uh -huh. I got really caught up in the whole, you know, gold bug, gold fever thing and and really in the sort of Austrian economics thinking, well, yeah. in the early middle, middle 2000s, everyone was saying, well, you know, hyperinflation is around the corner. And um, mm -hmm. the prophecy was made every year, and eventually it just didn't, it never came true, not in that sense, at least. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of gave up on, on the, I guess, the strictest interpretation of economics <laughs> via the Austrian school, and also Peter Schiff. Yeah. But, um, so, so I think mm -hmm. um, I have some, uh, some uh, similarities here, because I used to be a gold bug as well, uh, mm -hmm. and got out of it. And, I mean, the one, my reason for getting out of that was a little different, but... I think if you talk about inflation to like a typical uh, hardcore libertarian Austrian type person, I mean you're gonna. I think the first thing they're not they're they're not gonna be on the definition of inflation, right? So um, they're gonna say inflation is just the supply of money, and therefore if it increases the supply of money is de facto. I mean it's just, it it is inflation, right. and not the cost of goods, for example. Um, well, even in the, in the United just, States, yeah. the cost, don't yeah. they use the consumer price in, index as a, as a measure of inflation in practical terms? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so for everybody else, I mean, inflation is meant to be like the cost of goods, but for 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 like a hardcore libertarian, it's it's a different meaning sometimes. Um, so I guess that's that devolves into discussion of how you define words and stuff like that. So. I don't view that as. I mean, it could be particularly productive, but I don't think it's it's an economic uh, argument. It's it's more of a linguistic argument, I think. Yeah. Uh, so and, it's actually not a very helpful one. It's it's essentially yeah. semantics. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and then the second thing with hyperinflation is um, is with this predictions. I think it, it's kind of it's a bit reckless to be predicting these sorts. I mean, with predicting the future, no one can really predict it. So there can still be hyperinflation. Um, there may not be, and I think it's kind of reckless to be predicting that uh, year in and year out. Um, well, yeah, he, he never was yeah. right about it. I mean, yeah, the, the kind and of if you really thought, you know, hmm. yeah. Um, so if you really thought hyperinflation was around the corner, then you, you'd have to like repackage your investment portfolio to be um, suited for that investment scenario, and yet that could end up being harmful 
to a lot of people. So I, I want to take the example of Japan first, because so a lot of the problems that the United States is facing now or have faced in the last five to ten years, um, Japan has already sort of faced, you know, ever since the ni- 1989, basically. Mm. The zombie they had huge, episode. huge increases in government debt, zombie banks. Mm. The gov- banks won't lend. Same thing in the United States right now. The banks have huge reserves. They're not lending it out. Mm. Um, and then you have, uh, as I said, I mean, I'll, I'm repeating it, but Japan has huge uh, fiscal debt. Um, and then they also have engaged in, in quantitative easing, and they've done it before the United States. And yet, all you see in Japan is not inflation. I mean, you don't even need to go to hyperinflation. You don't even see any inflation. You're, you're slightly deflationary type of thing. Uh, if you had invested in Japanese government debt, like the long, long-term government debt back in the 90s, where when the government Japanese government spending was out of control, um, actually that w- might have been a good investment, right? So uh, because the Japanese stock market hasn't really gone anywhere for 20 years. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, so there's some in some circles, as, as, my, as far as my understanding goes, it, it isn't even call, called the last decade. It's it's essentially called the, the last score because it's it's, it's yeah. basically been ongoing. The yeah. the stagnation, and uh, yeah, yeah. So I mean, Japan like does these aggressive uh, monetary policies, and, and they don't seem to work. The United States, you know, they did the QE. I think. For the United States, I think the overall uh, consensus sort of is that it's more effective than the than the case in Japan for some reason, and the reason and and the result being that you know the stock prices in in the U.S. has gone up to record highs, uh, the real estate prices have really in a lot of places have exceeded their former high, former highs in 2006. So in terms of asset prices, it seems to have worked. Unlike Japan, where where you know it never it still never. Uh, after all these years, it still hasn't gone back to 1989 levels with, of with prices. With regards to Peter Schiff, I mean, you mentioned something that you kind of at least alluded to it that if if he actually believed, and this was yeah. this were his real conviction that hyperinflation around the corner, yeah. he wouldn't be as calm as he is when he's talking about hyperinflation because he, yeah. all his portfolios would have to be changed vastly or highly uh-huh. differentiated from what they are now. And I'm wondering if it's just sort of his mantra now or has been to sort of talk about this. And there's a kind of, it's almost a kind of populism, economic populism more than anything else where he yeah. says, well, hyperinflation's around the corner. I'm an Austrian, blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. Uh, rather than, than actual, his actual conviction and belief, economic belief. I'm wondering if that's the case. So I think for Peter Schiff's case, um, I, I don't know of his personal portfolio, but it does seem like he, he's engaged in the gold business. So maybe that would be consistent with his predictions. Yeah. Um, but any, anyone that believes that you know that sort of thing will occur, uh, then then I guess you would invest in something like commodities like gold. Um, I mean, and on the top of gold, yeah. it's a very important topic, yeah. obviously, particularly yeah. in the history of uh, American economic policy, because we, as we yeah. know. Uh, the United States uh, got off uh, being anchored down to gold uh, dur- during the Nixon administration in the, in the early 70s, uh, in large measure, I think, due to the cost of the Vietnam War. I mean, one thing the Austrians yeah. are, are, are correct about, I think, is mm-hmm. that when you have a currency tar- tied to a hard asset such as gold, uh, yeah. it becomes difficult to overspend because the hard asset, of course, is in limited quantity and mm-hmm. the currency can only be backed up to a certain extent, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So it makes sense. It makes sense in the context of running a, a, the Vietnam War that you would want to get off of that. Now, it seems these days that the idea of a gold-backed currency is more a pipe dream and a, a fantasy than anything with any tangible uh, application of reality whatsoever. If only because. Uh, the global nature of the economy. I mean, the, the same thing, the same aspect of gold that I mentioned, that sort of limiting factor in, in preventing war, or at least limiting the execution of war. Mm-hmm. Uh, could it not also be a limitation in, well, if if everything needs to be backed up by hard assets such as gold, but somebody calculates you need a certain amount of currency in circulation that exceeds whatever the 
uh, the hard asset backing the currency might be, that could be a problem, could it not? Uh, so, so I think one. Of the, so I think you're talking about the concern that you know the economy is growing, but the supply goal is kind of steady. So yes, therefore, precisely. there might be a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think with regard to that, I mean, we we had a a, a sort of a. So I mean, the Austrians will refer to this period. So the classical gold standard period between like 1880 to the World War One, basically about 30 years or so. Um, and if you just look at England or, or Great Britain. Um, it's a little, it goes back a little bit further than that. Uh, internationally, I think the international classical standard is from 1880 to, to World War I. Um, and during that period, um, there really wasn't any issue with um, using gold as a currency, even though you know, productivity during that period increased a lot and there was a lot more goods than there were before. And I think in our age of digital spending, you could have gold in some sort of a location where, you know, you would only be spending like smaller digits, smaller fractions of the gold, I suppose. So I think it's it's possible if you really wanted to go back to it. But political, politically, I don't think it's possible at all. And it is a pipe, pipe dream, I do believe, in, in political terms, in the, in, in, in the sense that we're just not going to go back to the gold standard. I mean, even even if there are a cla- I mean, some some uh, inherent benefits to the gold standards versus the, the, the paper money, um, I just don't see it happening. What about cryptocurrencies uh, backed by an, uh, an, not necessarily gold, but some alleged uh-huh. hard asset? What, what are your thoughts on I, that? I, I think that's actually more possible. <laughs> I think that's actually possible. I think gold politically impossible. Cryptocurrencies, it, it could be possible. I think um, one of the I think I think the prime benefit of of having a cryptocurrency is that you know you get to uh, evade foreign currency controls. And um, I think a lot of your Western audience won't understand <laughs> what's meant by a foreign currency control. But a lot of countries, including places like China, you just can't take money out of the country. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so you, even if you're a rich person in China, it's very hard for you to take that money out and kind of uh, diversify out of the country so that you're not as affected by the political uh, risks involved. And for example, if you were in Venezuela now and you were a Venezuelan, you can't take money out. I mean, it's, not, it's hard for you to do that. So... Well, I, yeah, take, that, that, that would yeah. be a, a fairly minor concern these days yeah. <laughs> in, in Venezuela. I think uh, yeah. you, you, you best be packing several several firearms if, <laughs> in addition to that concern. Well, the China, yeah. I mean, let's China, say, sorry, go on. Yeah. Uh, so let's say you had like a block of gold in Venezuela. You had like a brick, couple of bricks of gold in Venezuela. Mm-hmm. They're not going to let you take that out of there. Um, even if you, if you, let's say you didn't have... You didn't take any Venezuelan currency. You just have this gold block, gold ingots. That's worth a lot. You can't take it out. They're not going to let you do that politically. Um, so in that sense, I think cryptocurrency have that inherent advantage that you can you can take money out of these uh, political politically uh, complicated situations. So I think that's one advantage. So if you see a lot of uh, political turmoil in the future, I, I do see a possibility in which that that type of currencies can be used. But you know, right now it's just a method of speculation. Um, mm. But but I do see sort of a possibility for gold. I mean I don't I don't really see it as a possibility. Well, I think Bank you should, of China you bought see. up a lot of gold in recent years, as far as I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that's that's more of a sort of a. It's not. I don't think they they necessarily know what they're doing. It's just that everybody every other central bank has gold. So oh, right. why don't they it's sort of invest in copycats? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Now the, you mentioned um, the inability to diversify in countries such as China or. Um, Venezuela. Now, yeah. this is, seems to me would be a, a politically motivated on their part mm-hmm. uh, more yeah. than anything else. Uh, yeah. th- is this actually due to some sort of political ideology on their part, or th- th- is there some economic aspect to it that they, they're looking to uh, achieve? Uh, so I think it's based on a sort of mercantilist type of um, mm-hmm. economic thinking. So, so South Korea used to have this same type of uh, foreign currency controls. Right. So if you tried to take dollars out of Korea, um, it would be very difficult. It would have been very difficult in the past. Now, now it's much easier, but in the past it was really difficult. It's kind of like China. Hmm. Um, so they're, they're, they, 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 these countries, because they're developing, um, are, are traditionally capital constrained. So they have a lot of labor, but they don't have a lot of capital. So they want 
to prevent as capital from leaving the country as much as they can. And one way of doing that is, is to uh, prevent you from taking money out of the com country, converting money into dollars and things like that. So that, that's, I think, the primary motivation. And there are obviously other political motivations as well. Yeah, well, I mean, you mentioned in your own country of South Korea. Yeah. Which, I mean, even if you don't know anything about South Korea, the first thing in terms of we talk about money that strikes the eye yeah. is, uh, you know, somebody somebody gives <laughs> you, hands you like... Uh, you like munch on one, and you're thinking uh, that's that's a hundred thousand. By the way, um, yeah. uh, it, like whoa, my God, I'm, I'm rich, and then you just realize, oh, well, that's just a hundred bucks. Oh, yeah. So maybe I mean this would be an area of expertise for you. Maybe you can tell us a little about the history of of how because it is interesting. Why the hell yeah. the one the South Korean one has such large nominations in terms of its currency. It just doesn't exist so, anyplace else. So in this case, I, I can definitely uh, blame Japan I, or, or the Korean willingness to base <laughs> everything, their economic, copy the economic policy of Japan. So I think when they, when they first started out, I think it was, um, they wanted to base their currency sort of similar to the yen. And you should know that the yen is also slightly uh, yeah. inflated in terms it's of... Not as bad, price, though, but, you know, should point out. It's not as bad. So... Um, in in Korea, basically, what happened was, I think it just, I think it's one more digit than the yen, basically. No. Um, if you want to convert it, if you if you think a dollar is a thousand one, dollar is basically a hundred yen, right? So, no. I mean, so, somewhere along that line. So, I think I think that's what happened when when the initial economic planners thought about uh, setting up their currency, they based it off the off the value of the yen, no. and that's how we got here. Um, if they had based it on on the dollar, I think it, the situation <laughs> wouldn't have been as bad as as it is now. I think there are talks about uh, a currency reform, so so a thousand one for for one a new one, I suppose. But uh, but that does this have a practical impact and, and and detrimental, more importantly, detrimental impact to the Korean economy. Uh, um, I think I think the main main motivation for doing it would be it's kind of embarrassing to have this uh, <laughs> so many digits in your currency. Uh, so sort of a face saving measure, I suppose. Right. Um, well, detriment so wise, yeah. <laughs> detriment wise, um, I mean, I think there might be initial confusion um, at 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 the time of uh, transition, but I don't see too much problems with it actually. So Just effectively, minor, minor. what happened was the. Mm -hmm. the the South Korean economic authorities were attempting to copy or emulate Japanese policies. Yeah, uh, and long most long of them were also yeah, most of them were also Japanese uh, Jap educated in Japan during the uh, during the colonial period, especially right. initially. So that's that's really all they knew. I'm, uh, I'm most of what they knew. yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting how how that, uh, that, that that's how that impact. Yeah. So. On the other hand, I mean, we've talked about inflation a bit in, in developed countries. There was a yeah. real uh, case scenario in Zimbabwe that probably is ongoing. I haven't really checked recently, but certainly in recent years mm -hmm. of the type of runaway mm -hmm. inflation that, that had only existed 100 years ago, 90, 80 years ago, where people, you know, uh, some, a good might cost you know, 10 million Zimbabwean dollars. <laughs> and that, yeah. that means, you know, 10 bucks in USD. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. If it's I mean, exact conversion, but yeah. What so happened, if you look what at happened the, there exactly? Do you think? Uh, so I haven't actually looked in detail with the Zimbabwe situation, but if you look at the history of uh, history of hyperinflation, it's it's just like you pointed out earlier. So before World War One, uh, there's very few instances of hyperinflation, meaning monthly inflation of over fifty percent. Yeah. Fifty uh, percent inflation in a month. Uh, that's how typically it's defined. Um, there are very few cases of hyperinflation before World War One, and especially remember before World War One, there was a 30-year period of the classical gold standard, and there wasn't going to be any. I mean, there's not even moderate inflation in that period. Um, and then you go, and then you go to post uh, World War One period, where you have all sorts of all sorts of hyperinflation in in various uh, European countries, where where the, these governments are kind of experimenting with uh, what they can do with paper currencies. I think is what's going on. And then after that, after World War II, I think all the hyperinflation um, that you see, it's it's really uh, third world. I think or, or um, you know uh, countries that have just co come out of uh, communism. 
Uh, so you, you don't expect to see it in relatively reasonably sophisticated countries. You're not going to see hyperinflation. Uh, and, and all and all these hyperinflation cases that I've looked at, it, the, the, the reason is that the government started printing currencies to finance their fiscal um, fiscal policy. So they printed money uh, to, to finance their fiscal policy. Um, and you might think, well, that's pretty similar to what we're doing right now with uh, with um, with respect to quantitative easing, because because the central bank is buying government government bonds basically. So you might think, well, that's similar, and it is similar. Um, but I think what what really counteracts it is is the fact that a lot of these commercial banks are are putting their reserves uh, a lot a lot of these reserves into the central bank and they're not lending it out. So that that I think is the major difference. And a lot of these other countries, that's not what happened. Uh, you didn't have this like massive banking system that you have in, in, right. in uh, advanced. It's effectively a, a question of sophistication. I mean, the, the, clearly the banking system so. in Zimbabwe. We, we know uh -huh. after uh, wrote. Well, I mean, we, there's good <laughs> evidence to suggest that on all manner of fronts in Zimbabwe, things fell apart. I mean, yeah. agriculture, the industry fell apart. All things. So the idea that mm -hmm. uh, I, I guess the the economic policy and the banking policy would be uh, much better. I mean, it makes sense basically. That because it's basically yeah. a banana, it's a banana republic, uh, effectively. And, and you, you can sort of see this with um, sort of the metallic currencies like the gold standard or silver standard. Um, initially, like in the Middle Ages, what you had was a uh, seigneurage. So what happened was the currency, even though it was gold based or silver based, uh, the governments debased it uh, slowly over time. So if you look at it over the years, it's actually more like uh, two percent inflation per year. So it's kind of similar to. What the central bank is aiming for right now, but during those periods uh, or the Renaissance, the governments had they kind of debased their currency, meaning that if you had like a gold coin, uh, you would mix it with other metals so that the gold uh, purity would go well, down. This goes back earlier during the Roman Empire when the when the Romans yeah were oh yeah exactly in, in, in yeah. military campaigns they would debase yeah. the the coins and clip them yeah so yeah uh, clip them exactly yeah. yeah but but I think what happened is. Um, I think once you go up to the Industrial Revolution, uh, this type of debasing, I mean, it's no longer, it's not feasible anymore. I mean, it's, you're too sophisticated for that kind of thing. The society is too sophisticated for that debasement. That's why you don't have that kind of thing anymore. And I think that's one of the reasons why you ended up with the classical gold standard. Um, similarly, with the paper money, I think the advanced economy sort of know how to deal with situations so that it doesn't lead to hyperinflation. Now, you can end up with something like stagflation or, or high inflation like you had in the 60s and the 70s, mm -hmm. but it's not going to be hyperinflation. It's, and those, are, those two are completely different things. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I mean, I, I, I was born in the 70s, but I didn't really directly experience it, but I certainly heard the stories. Um, yeah. It's interesting you bring up the Renaissance because I'm not a... A historian, or for that matter, an economic historian, but um, based on my recollection, that is really the period in European history where the, you have the proper emergence of banks, yeah, um, as opposed to earlier times. Uh, you know, as a sort of lending agency, as it were, a for-profit <laughs> lending agency. Um, so it makes sense that you you would see the we talked about the debasement uh, this uh, far more as as we enter that period. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, so so I think a lot of these. So you see, I think the history is that the Byzantine Empire had gold coins that were widely circulated. Um, but ever since the Byzantine Empire started to fall, you had the Renaissance basically, and then you had these city, city states in, in in Italy um, that that issued their uh, currencies. Um, and I think uh, the one in Florence. So the city state of Florence had a gold coin that was. Uh, that maintained its value, uh, mostly, I think, relatively well compared to other, other currencies. Yeah, well, and, Florence and once was these... the banking center of, yeah. of, of, of well, a, a huge chunk of history in, in, in Europe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, and then a lot of other, other countries started to, you know, introduce their own currencies, and then they had some mishaps. You know, it, it didn't all work out in the middle, but eventually they... they uh, went to this gold standard where people were, aren't going to be clipping gold coins and they aren't going to be debasing them. Um, because I think, you know, it's, I, I think what happened was society advanced to, to a stage where that, that kind of thing wouldn't work anymore. 
Yeah, but then, of course, in, in terms of European history, uh, we enter a period, particularly during colonial expansion of mercantilism and protectionism, uh-huh. yeah. uh, which I think there's at least hard historical evidence to suggest that these practices almost inevitably lead to, to conflict. Uh, armed uh, conflict. So I think what happened was, I think our understanding of economic history is that uh, during this um, classical gold, gold standards period, people weren't hoarding gold coins. So what happened was the Bank of England, because it had, because England has such a stronghold over world trade, what they would do is they, they were relatively an impartial um, arbitrator, I, I suppose, of, of uh, currency exchange rates. And what they would do is they would um, raise interest if, if their gold supply was going down and then lower interest, uh, vice versa. And I think that that period coincides with this period of peace before World War One that we had. Um, and then before that, we had a lot of wars. So I think it's, uh, we kind of think it's causal, but I don't think we ha- we can we can say for sure that that it is. But it's definitely correlated for sure. Yeah. And then well, after, hmm. yeah. So after World War One, what happened was this this gold standard broke down. You had a lot of these conflicts, which led to World War Two. So after World War Two, people thought, well, you know, the period before World War One, we had this peace, and that was a lot of this world trade. Uh, people didn't engage in mercantilism, and uh, we didn't have a lot of international conflicts back then. So I think that's that's why we got this idea of uh, mercantilism leading to uh, war. I'm not exactly sure it's causal, though. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. there are obviously, in the case of World War One yeah. and Two, there are a lot of yeah. political factors uh, at play as well that uh, that kind of muddy the waters. I mean, I yeah, I, I think in any in any discipline, one tends to have a tendency to sort of look for things in a monocausal fashion. So economists will yeah look to define things and understand things purely in terms of economics when there are other factors at play. I mean, maybe a sociologist would. Look at behavior and, um, and and what have you. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's it's. I mean, I, I say I mentioned this is because there are a, a lot of these sort of alternative uh, modes of thought on the internet uh, suggests a kind of return to protectionist economic policies. Uh-huh. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. And you know, I'm cu- curious to see your thoughts on that. I, I think there are. I mean, I mean, it could definitely. Yeah, but there are benefits and there are there, you know there are positives and negatives. I mean, you no know, Japan and, and South Korea had a, ran along protectionist lines for quite some time, and we've talked about this before. I and mean, there were there were nice things to it, sort of, and, and not so nice things. Uh, but yeah, in in the current years, they call it 2017. Could <laughs> you, in your wildest imagination, dreams, imagine a, a major Government in, in collusion with the central bank, say with the ECB, with the European uh-huh. Union, or the United States government, Canada, saying, "Well, you know, we're going back to emergency." I and mean, effectively, that's what Donald Trump had prom- promised—a kind of protectionist yeah. uh, state of affairs. But that seems totally un- uh, unfeasible to me. I, how? How? Because this is not the way the world economy works anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, thoughts on so, that? So, yeah. So, I mean, so we, we, I mean, so that's why I think people are concerned about it is because pre World War One we had this large increase in world trade which collapsed after World War One. So, I mean, it could it could still happen. Um, it could still definitely happen uh, because I think I mean human nature didn't change. I mean the economic structure changed, but but human nature didn't change. So we could end up with a political scenario in which that that could happen. Um, mm. But I, I think especially because, well, well, especially because when you have the United States that's um, sort of at the center of all power, it's easier to have like an orderly um, system of trade, like was the case with Great Britain before World War One. But once, I mean, once the United States, I mean, declines for whatever reason, then, then I mean, I think all all bets are off. Well, the table, already I has been, but declined. I don't know. Yeah, uh, I think yeah. it's inarguable. I mean. The, yeah. the dollar standard replaced the gold standard effectively. Um, yeah. And but but the, the heyday of the American Empire, it's over. It's been over. Yeah. I mean, you could argue say nine eleven, right? I mean, it, it basically uh-huh. 
I mean, certainly the United States is still a major player, but it, it's not the player that everyone pays homage to uh, anymore. Mm-hmm. And I think yeah, um, that's why we see a rise in, in China and, and also the, 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 the greater economic assertion or the assertive force in, in China. China's, yeah. uh, I mean, China, hmm. yeah. uh, China for its all, all its credit, I mean, they're, they're a, um, I guess, a manufacturing powerhouse. They're a uh, credit bubble <laughs> powerhouse, I would say. Um, but financially, it's they're really uh, their financial system is really repressive, and, and as long as that's not liberated to any extent, there there cannot be a system that relies on China because uh, you know they have fixed exchange rates. You know, there's yeah. no free flow of current of capital. But you, know, yeah. I, I would say that the, yeah. the Chinese. Here's the thing. I mean, there's uh-huh. something ideological about the way the Chinese government operates, and consequently, the say the Bank of China. I think that they. The Chinese, I mean, they refer to themselves as the Middle Kingdom. I think in general, uh-huh. as you well know from Korean culture, you know, yeah. East Asian culture is yeah. very ethnocentric. They're very sort of, you know, we're mm-hmm. sort of the center of the universe. That's particularly true of China yeah. for a variety of reasons. I don't think they care very much if their economic system isn't optimized for, you know, free, free globalized trade. Uh, uh, yeah, so I mean, so I, so I agree with you. I, I agree with you completely. It's just that... Um, in order for the dollar standard to be seriously threatened by China, there is there really is no alternative at the moment. I mean, China is rising, but not not to that stage. Yeah, no, I I don't disagree with that. It's just that as as long as China maintains this sort of, I guess you could call it ideological purity or rigidity, you know, in terms yeah. of its whether it's political policies or economic policies, and I think there are some signs of that loosening up uh, slowly but surely. <laughs> Uh, and, and it, yeah. it probably oh, so be- a matter of time. But uh... yeah, before we, we uh, go ahead on the topic, with regard to hyperinflation, the government's, um, just, just to add on a couple of things, um, even though it's kind of unrelated to China, I suppose, the governments don't really, there's no, I mean, I think the Austrians push forward for the hyperinflation scenario because one of the reasons I think they give is that it's beneficial to the government. But I think it's not necessarily the case that it is beneficial to the governments in the sense that if you have high inflation, when you're taxing somebody, that the amount that you're taxed lags when you have to actually have to pay it. Hmm. So if you have runaway inflation like hyperinflation, it's actually it's, it's a disadvantage to the government because they have to get paid later on. Um, so if you have any sort of high inflation, it's not actually that great for the government either in terms of it. So they're also the... Um, Governments can also be the uh, the the you know the the receiving end of hyperinflation, so to speak. Um, and also, in the scenarios of hyperinflation, you also get a lot of high unemployment. So if you look at the historic episodes of hyperinflation, you get a lot of um, unemployment as well. And this, I mean, I, I think you might go into this later on, but you know, this is this goes against the the Phillips curve type argument where you have more inflation and then you have less unemployment. Actually, if you have, when you have, when you have hyperinflation, you actually have a lot more unemployment. Hmm. Um, and then the final thing is that inflation is actually really, really unpopular with people. So if you, if, so I think Robert Schiller did a survey paper on this. And if you ask people whether they'd rather have unemployment, higher unemployment rates or higher inflation rates, people will typically say they'd rather have higher unemployment rates. So it's really unemployed. It's inflation is really unemployed, unpopular. So in the sense that you have democratic governments, uh, politically speaking, it's, 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 um, well, I, that makes suicidal. sense. Uh, if Perfectly. only that makes sense if only because if the purchasing power of a currency is dramatically altered, uh, is, let's say, you know, you have high unemployment, really high unemployment, like 11% yeah. or something like that. Um, you know, that's bad. Right, but yeah. uh, let's just assume, for the sake of argument, that the purchasing power of the currency in this situation is stable. Well, it means that whatever money you do have is going to still be able to buy the goods that you need. Versus a yeah. scenario where, okay, maybe the unemployment's five percent, but you have something like runaway inflation or hyperinflation, and uh, you know you can't really buy anything with the money you're making. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so I think so the scenario of hyperinflation really, I think. I don't think it's likely to happen in, in, in advanced economies. I mean, I can't be wrong. It's just you're, we're talking about predicting the future. So, I mean, I can't Nobody pretend can that I know what's going to happen. Not even Peter yeah. Schiff. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, so there still can be hyperinflation. I don't see it happening. That's that's all. No, and I, th- I think uh, I think it's it's really a, it's something from the past, or it's a characteristic of banana republics, uh, like in Africa or uh, South American yeah. countries or what have you. Yeah, countries that and also like like. Yeah, and like like you mentioned, the, the a lot of these Austrian thinkers they're based on a on the period of you know the pre World War II period where there was a lot of hyperinflation in these European countries yeah. uh, that that these people experienced. So it's uh, probably had a larger effect on them. It it's it, it it's larger in the theories and everything. But um, well, it, right now is, I think this it's, isn't it's unique to so, economics. I mean, um, yeah. people react. Theoretician uh, theoreticians react. To their circumstances, whether economic or not. I mean, I look at a guy like um, Thomas Hobbes, who wrote this massive political tome, The Leviathan, in response to mm-hmm. the chaos of the English Civil War that he had lived through. He lived to back in '94, and he's yeah. arguing essentially for an autocracy, for 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 a tyrant. I mean, he, that didn't come out of out of nowhere. So the Austrians, yeah. in turn, saw the problems that arose uh, due to economic policy as well as. I mean, not, the thing about I mean, I, I guess it's very difficult to completely divorce economic policy from politics because whenever you think of Austrian economics, it's very difficult to divorce that from very strict lines of sort of libertarian thinking or yeah. classical liberalism. Uh, so, for example, the road to serfdom, Hayek's work. I mean, yeah, it's it's an economic treatise, but it's also a political one. And the, the, they seem inextricably linked, whereas a guy like Paul Krugman, who... <laughs> Some years back, I mean, to this day, I can't be sure if he was serious. He said, you know, if there were, it'd be good to pretend that there's an alien invasion so we could, <laughs> you know, get people jobs. Uh, he definitely leans in a different direction. Uh, I, I guess it's impossible yeah. to be an apolitical economist because you can, I, I mean, of course, there are things like econometrics and you can turn economics into a, what appears to be a mathematical science, but at the end of the day, economics is about people engaging in certain behaviors, right? So, yeah, I guess you can't divorce it from the political, ultimately. Especially if you're talking about something like inflation. Um, yeah. Or, or in my 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 uh, my field of labor, I, I guess I could call it if I could call it my field of labor. You have things like minimum wage and immigration. Where this is uh, <laughs> very, very politically charged, and it's the same case for for inflation as well. I think, though, I think in in academic research right now, uh, people have pushed this this mathematical version of economics uh, to such a degree that you would you'd be surprised to find a large part of it is relatively more apolitical than 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 you would think. Hmm. Well, I mean, in so your for example, opposite. yeah. Uh, so, for example, in macroeconomics, uh, most people, um, you know, are in the sort of the, the model, what's called the real economy. Hmm. So, in, the, in in these models, there are no there are no currencies. So, it's real in the sense that uh, we only look at production, and we don't go into uh, economists don't go into things like uh, monetary policies and things like. That. Things like that. So interests are is real interest, meaning that it's not the nominal interest. We, we typically look at real interest. Uh, a huge emphasis is put on TFP, total factor productivity, um, a TFP shocks or, or what's related to TFP shocks, um, and then other sort of frictions in the economy that's not necessarily related to to uh, monetary issues, like, um, for example, like investments and things like that. The nature of investments, uh, or, or the nature of, of, of labor markets, uh, so like search frictions and things, things like this. That's not necessarily linked to any sort of like uh, inflation argument, um, and and it's really gone off in in this like mathematical uh, <laughs> mathematical approach. So you, you'd be kind of surprised to find where where a lot of uh, economic econo- academic uh, economics is at the moment. It's um, I guess one of the benefits of, of mathematics. It's uh, <laughs> it's a lot less uh, political than it was. Well, certainly, but in your field of, of labor economics, I mean, as you yeah. mentioned, minimal wage is, is pretty charged, and yeah. uh, that is a, a frequent topic in discussions with libertarians or, or even people uh-huh. of the Austrian school. In fact, every Austrian would argue that minimum wage laws uh, mm-hmm. hurt 
hurt the economy, hurt individuals, uh, and and well, for reasons of you know, people lose opportunities and they, they could otherwise be employed. Uh, I guess the counter argument to that, coming from someone who's, mm-hmm. I, I I'm not for minimum uh, wage laws, but it would be uh, you know, well, it doesn't matter if 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 it's below a certain threshold, the money uh-huh. the guy's earning, well, he won't be able to buy anything with a neighbor, or very little. So yeah. as someone who's studied this in great depth, what are your views on minimal wage laws and its effects on the economy? Uh, so my, my, my views is it's, uh, it doesn't help. <laughs> to, it doesn't help the worker that it's supposed to help. And I think that's the consensus, consensus actually in labor. Um, Despite, so, so it's effectively, and this my uh-huh. this my view as well, but yeah. minimum wage laws, it, it has less to do with economics and more to do with fe- what I would call feel good political yeah. motivations. That, yeah. yeah. Oh, we'll have. It's one of these these policies that we have that, well, it's just there to make people feel good about themselves. It doesn't yeah. have a, it doesn't actually have a positive impact. It's like it's like the welfare state and in, in supplying single mothers with endless heaps of cash. It's not. Yeah. It doesn't seem to be. There doesn't seem to be a real economic reason behind it. And yeah. I mean, so there, there's helpful. there's papers on both sides of the debate, obviously. But my consensus, uh, my view is that the consensus is um, that the minimum wage laws don't help the people because their their working hours get reduced. Um, and and that's that's my view of where the, the literature is. Interesting thing is that um, there's been these like uh, petitions signed by economists that are both for and against the minimum wage increases. And a lot of these economists don't do labor, um, but you know this is very ideologically driven. And and as you just noted, you know this uh, ideology will will trump uh, <laughs> any sort of I mean rationality. Even for the people who are doing the doing the economics, basically. Yeah, um, I mean, and, and effectively, it doesn't really matter because what you see in the United States, and I even saw this in New York growing up in the, in the eighties, mm-hmm. was um, people evading minimum wage laws. That is, employers, <laughs> not so ironic, the Korean fruit and vegetable market owners yeah. <laughs> would employ Guatemalans and Mexicans and whatever. <laughs> Uh-huh. They weren't getting minimum wage. It was obvious <laughs> they weren't getting minimum yeah. wage. They were working under the table, and they were uh-huh. getting some wage, presumably, um, yeah. but it, it definitely wasn't a minimum. So people will find a way, employers will find a way to circumvent uh, the stipulations, uh, the rules of, of minimum wage. And, and right now, yeah. I, I think it's even it's even worse. Or it's certainly, you can find this to a greater degree in the United States than you could in the 80s. Mm-hmm. Of lots of Central Americans, South Americans now increasingly um, working under the table uh, yeah. for below minimum wage, and the employers are all too happy to pay them below minimum wage because you know if you can pay someone three dollars an hour yeah. uh, for the same labor, you know you save money. It's more efficient. They're willing. To, they're willing to take on the work, and they're willing to yeah. receive that specific wage. Um, whereas uh, you know, someone working within the confines of laws has a problem. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, so I think there's a, I mean, th- this made the news, but there's also a recent study um, that looked at the uh, changes after the minimum wage laws in Seattle. Um, and that was also, I mean, that was also consistent with uh, the expectation that, you know, once you raise minimum wages to the degree that Seattle has, uh, Work, the the employers just uh, reduce working hours for the employees, yeah. and I think, yeah, so it's just I mean it doesn't really work. I mean it doesn't help the people that it's supposed to help. Um, yeah, but once again, this is yeah. a classic yeah. example. I mean, this is in the realm of economics, but there's so many other examples yeah. of a policy which there for which there's abundant evidence it doesn't work particularly well, but it's not going anywhere because it's just sort of yeah. It's the status quo. Well, okay, we have a minimum wage. We need to periodically raise it. Uh, yeah. The welfare state is is. I mean, we're going to start on the welfare state, but in terms of mm-hmm. labor mobility, not having a welfare state is a lot better because then you get skilled labor as opposed to people coming in just to get the as the the Gibbs as some people uh, would refer to the, the benefits. In fact. Yeah. Um, it's almost a certainty. I won't say it's a certainty because we don't know for sure, but it's 99% sure 
that the uh, European immigration crisis could have been prevented if European countries had had done two things. One, did not have a rob robust welfare state at all. Uh, in fact, it definitely would have prevented that. Or two, um, had, a, had a much more limited one, you know, of the sort that Eastern European countries don't get much of this uh, for a variety of reasons, but one of them is they don't have a lot of money and they don't have a, a generous welfare state that's distributing um, that money. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. But once again, they're not getting rid of that <laughs> because it's this sort of feel good platitude again. I mean, you know, welfare state, it's humane, blah, blah, blah. Minimum wage is humane. And this yeah. is just. So it's uh, going gonna, gonna to get worse before it gets better, right? So. <laughs> well, well, it's not going to, Joe, it's not going to just get worse and just get better. I mean, this is just one example. Yes. Is it? There are countless examples. We're talking about the realm of economics here, but things we know to be non-functional, or at least function poorly, be it in a welfare state, minimum wage laws. We know, for example, I mean, look at the divorce industry, you know, it, it, particularly in the West. But it's, yeah. a, it, it's, it's not good for really anyone. I mean, even the women, yeah. it's, it's, you could argue, they're yeah. not particularly happy, even though they're certainly making financial profit off of it, and the lawyers as well. Um, so... But it's, it's that's not going anywhere because it's an entrenched status quo thing, and it's just the way it's done. Yeah. Um, and there are too many examples of this in society, ranging from the political to the economic to other things, where which is clear that, that this, the, the American educational system, awful, awful. Yeah. I mean, it was bad when I was young, and that it, it's it's you know there's no description for how bad it is now. Um, but we're just kind of stuck with these rules and, and policies of the uh, yeah. Department of Education. I mean, the United States was doing fine before that. And in this sense, I agree with the libertarians. Uh, but so yeah. I, I, I mean, I mean, I agree. I, I mean, I just have to put it out there. I agree with a lot of the Austrian view. And I, I also consider myself a libertarian in a lot of ways. It's just that the, some of their theories on hyperinflation, it's just, uh, it's just I don't see it. I mean, I just well, disagree with uh, it's, a lot it's of their It's kind of, you know, you don't, when it comes to any theory, whether it's economic or otherwise, you don't necessarily want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And so yeah. in terms of, of libertarianism, I, I, I'm i sympathetic to it. I would never call myself that anymore. But clearly yeah. their theories of on hyperinflation are just not, don't measure up to reality, at least anymore. But yeah. I think they're right about, you know, the bloated size of government, minimum wage laws, um, immigration policies and the relationship between welfare and that, I mean, that seems to be spot on, mm -hmm. but it doesn't really matter. It's kind of, I guess at the core of this is people's immunity to evidence, whatever the yeah. source might be, you know, it doesn't matter the field. Um, yeah. People don't really care about evidence. I mean, you could, you could probably get a 90% world consensus. It's not going to happen, but say of the best yeah. economists saying, well, this doesn't work. Historically, hasn't worked. It hasn't worked three, four decades. We need to change something. But they're not the economists. Aren't the policymakers usually? And, yeah. uh, and I mean, here's for some a great example. I mean, Alan Greenspan, who was the Lord of the yeah. Federal Reserve for almost twenty years. <laughs> I think yeah. he was eighteen. But um, this guy was a hardcore Austrian for the longest time, and then he gets yeah. into office. It's not really an office. It's kind of a shady thing. But he. He, he becomes the king of the world, basically, because that's what the head of the Federal Reserve is in many ways. Uh, and the guy just, he just forgets all his previous ideology and his, his views, and he he just becomes the, the head of the Federal Reserve. And, and I just, yeah, you know, I think there's a lot of things that, yeah, a lot of things that are true, whether they're economic or not, just don't, don't withstand political pressure. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. And also, also one one other thing that I want to point out is that a lot of these central banks have a two percent uh, target inflation, hmm. um, but actually there is no academic basis for this two percent target. It, it's it's really an arbitrary target that the central bank set up, and they've repeated it so many times that to a layperson it sounds like there's there's got to be like this two percent and there's something behind it. There actually isn't uh, anything behind it. Um, Interesting. I think Milton Friedman wanted zero percent. I think he said. Yeah, or, or negative. was an interesting case because he was yeah. kind of, um, he wasn't as hardcore as a Hayek. In fact, Hayek yeah. would criticize him sometimes. He definitely mm -hmm. was supported in a more limited government, but he yeah. never was formally for, say, the abolition of the Federal Reserve or, or really limiting its influence. 
Yeah. Uh, and I'm not sure if that's because he just wanted to sort of work with the government because uh, you were stuck with it, or he just really thought that uh, you know, the Federal Reserve was a good thing overall. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I think there's a lot yeah. of bamboozlement to the layperson yeah. when it comes to things like the Federal Reserve and central banks. Yeah. The idea that they so, know so, exactly what they're doing, etc. Yeah, so the consensus in, in economics is inflation rates um, that are stable, um, expected inflation rates, as long as it's, uh, inflation is within expectation, it doesn't matter what it is. So that's, uh, that's the consensus view. Uh, once you have inflation that's going, you know, uh, you know, more volatile or higher or lower than inflation, then you start having, having effects on the economy. But the consensus is that it shouldn't really matter if it's within inflation, I mean, with, uh, within expectations. And if you, and in any model that if you base off of, you know, rational agents, you know, even though that, that assumption gets criticized a lot, it's not going to matter. Um, uh, and and I think one of the one of the victories, sort of the ideological victories, was was the uh, stagflation. Basically, the the Keynesians said the Keynesian idea back then was that if you have higher inflation, you have lower unemployment. This is the Phillips curve. Uh, the the monetarists said, you know, it's, that's not how it works. Um, and basically, they were proven right because during the period of stagflation, you had high inflation with high unemployment, which goes against the idea of the the Phillips curve. And, Basically, that, that was the idea. And after that, you know, people, uh, you know, we were in this stage of rational agent models and a lot of, a lot of math, that I can tell you. Problem, though, I mean, we know that human beings aren't rational agents. Yeah. So instead, so I think, um, I mean, a lot of economists will, will try to argue that, you know, we, we do try to uh, incorporate all, some of these some of these aspects, some of these frictions, as as economists like to call it, into into the models. But I think at the end of the day, though, they're they're still rational agent models. I mean, that's that's my view of it. Um, and and I think the whole whole field kind of needs some sort of a paradigm change before any any of this will go away. Yeah, but then yeah. once again, I'd yeah. say that even if there were a paradigm shift or change. Even if there were incontrovertible evidence that policy X has not worked for decades now, governments yeah. are going to change it. I mean, yeah. the, the democratic system is is terrible. Um, lots of dumb people voting in politicians who just want to stay in power, and a, and, and and they ignore evidence. I mean, it's yeah. Western civilization. Well, everyone, you know, South Koreans, uh, South Korea. <laughs> I mean, you know, the bridge on the, I mentioned this in a talk with the, I don't know if it was live or I said privately, but I'm sure you know about the phone booths on the, over the Han River, you could call up with a suicide <laughs> line. I mean, it's, yeah. there are patrols going up back and forth. Uh, most of the, you know, gov government is not, uh, I mean, this is not, it's not that great at stuff and it's, but it doesn't really matter because people just think it's a good. They think it's a good thing, so it just it, we 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 get more and more of the same. Yeah. Evidence be done. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if minimum wage laws uh, suck. Um. And, and and honestly, the it's not the employers. Like I said, you know, it's back in the '80s. The, the South Korean fruit and vegetable market owners they would just employ the Guatemalans <laughs> and. Yeah. Now California, they employ the Mexicans in the Guam. It just it yeah. doesn't really matter because they're they're still getting they're getting cheap labor. Um, yeah, but somebody who American citizen, for example, that might want to you know start his journey into the workforce, doesn't get the opportunity. Of course, we don't know what's going to happen. We've talked about this before publicly, but with UBI and and, and automation, I mean, many mm -hmm. many many things could be changed uh, forever, irrevocably, with the yeah. onset of autom automated labor across a variety of sectors. In which case. Discussions of minimum wage, it might be a completely new discussion. As in fact, the discussion might be what should the UBI be rather than <laughs> what, yeah. what should the minimum wage be. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah that's uh, that's uh, definitely something that's going to be a huge change if that ever happens. So we'll we'll, uh, we'll wait and see, I suppose. But well, I think for now, yeah. for now, I think the expectation is, I, I think the concern for for anybody who's investing or as interest in inflation would be when this uh, when this era of um, 
I suppose, uh, quantitative easing for, for the United States appears to be sort of over. I think the Fed seems to be willing to raise interest rates, even though, um, I mean, I, it does seem like they're thinking about it. I don't remember if they raised it or not. I think they were talking about it. I remember reading some articles that they were talking about. I'm, I'm not sure if they actually raised, raised rates. Uh, so, I mean, I don't know if that would actually change the economic environment of zero interest rates uh, that we're stuck in right now. Or if this is something that's going to continue for decades, like like it has in Japan, I think I think that's the that's the really the 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 most pressing sort of economic um, issue that that you know you should probably think about. Um, if this this sort of if if our future looks like Japan, then uh, really it's uh, it's hard hard to predict. I mean I mean in the case of Japan, the only only the best investment was in Japanese government bonds. Really ironic, but that, that's where it was. Um, well, I mean, and, uh, effectively, the consensus, as I understand it, is that yeah. since since the housing crisis, and, and basically since 2009, we've we've um, we've been in a it was not a depression, but certainly a depressed economy. Yeah, uh, you know. Things just never really picked up. Things have not picked up since then, really. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, uh, uh, so, so you have actually you have uh, in economics also you have this two percent real growth rate. So not not accounting for inflation, you have this long term trend of two percent growth um, over a long period of time. I think after after World War Two, you had sustained levels of growth over two of two percent. So that trend line has been broken after um, after the Great Recession and. In that sense, you know, we, this might the United States economy might be mimicking, mimicking the Japanese, mm-hmm. uh, and with uh, you know, there was, I think if you're if you're living in, I mean if if worldwide you might be a little concerned about the Chinese economy. Um, so if you look at so some one of the interesting things is that if you look at the money supply of the United States, um, it hasn't exploded. So there's no reason to worry about hyperinflation because the money supply hasn't, you know, increased to the degree that would cause hyperinflation. If you look at, for example, if you look at M2 and you subtract the bank res- the, the reserves that the commercial banks have in, in the central bank, um, the increase in money supply isn't isn't something you know spectacular. It's not that big, uh, so you shouldn't expect it uh, given given the amount of money that's out in in the um, in the economy. Um, in China, there's been a huge increase in money supply after the crisis. Uh, right now, I, I haven't checked in a couple of years, but I think um, by looking at how actually some of the peripheral economies and commodity prices are doing, that that's kind of directly related to China. I don't think Chinese, the Chinese economy is actually doing that well um, yeah, overall. I mean, uh... yeah. You hear that, although on the other hand, yeah. they're buying up lots of property in Australia, and uh, there's a lot of <laughs> yeah. investment in Africa as well. Some of it illicit, uh, to be fair. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah. I mean, so so China has, uh, if you can believe it, if you look at the M2 of China, uh, it's larger than the M2 of the United States, uh, despite the fact that the United States is actually a much larger economy. Um, so if you're actually, if you think about the Chinese taking that money out in whatever way they can do it and then investing abroad, that could partially explain how, how they're so able to um, in, buy up all these properties in Australia and Canada. Um, I think another another issue, I think one of the reasons, I think that's one of the reasons why the Chinese government wants to block that, uh, wants to crack down on things like Bitcoin or other, other measures of uh, uh Getting getting wealth out out of the Chinese economy. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, one thing is for sure. I mean, the the Chinese are, are playing the long term game here. I think. Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's possible. I think the individual Chinese are, are are. I think it's it's really good for them in the sense that they are buying property, diversifying out of China. I think it's a really great idea for the Chinese, for the Chinese government. I mean. 
I don't, I don't know. Well, I mean, do there's it. a kind of a theory, and I hear this often among yeah. Australians who are, you know, concerned, I guess, about this. Uh-huh. That, this idea that uh, if the Chinese economy goes, uh, you know, goes to shit, then Australia is because Australia is very dependent on that. Yeah, uh, will we'll suffer greatly as well. Mm-hmm. And in addition a lot of to other that, kinds, there's yeah. a kind of almost Machia- Machiavellian ambition on the part of the Chinese to sort of, you know, what in former times you might have done via, uh, via conquest, you kind of y- y- you buy people out basically, and yeah. uh, there's sort of a attempt to sort of uh, Chineseify everything through investment and and uh, and. And, and it's essentially acquisition of property. Yeah. I, I don't know yeah, if, so, I, if I have, I have yeah. no evidence for that because I'm just not, I'm yeah. not very informed of but people think that. Yeah. So, so I think if, if you are really concerned about the U.S. economy, I, I would, I would rec- I mean, for anybody who is concerned about the U.S. economy, um, probably just look at, I mean, I, I always say this to people, but if, you, if you're really worried that you, the United States is going to experience hyperinflation, you should just look at Japan. And as long as Japan's doing okay, there's no reason for the United States to step into hyperinflation either, because Japan has it worse in many ways uh, compared to the U.S. And then if you're looking at credit bubbles, I mean, I know that the U.S. like stock market and the real estate is back to previous highs or higher, but then there's also credit bubbles in China, and you know it's just just worse. Actually, it's worse than worse than the United States. Uh, so, yeah. Well, just, I, I, think, you know, I think there are other things going on in the global economy. Yeah, one thing that can you know be put to rest is unless we're living in Zimbabwe or you know Venezuela, yeah. we don't really need to have a real concern about hyperinflation. Yeah. Um, of greater concern is is will be long term things like automation and um, and what have you. So yeah, uh, I mean there could we could see a return to like moderate inflation or or reasonably high inflation, I suppose, or stagflation, something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah. once again, that's not not, not the wheelbarrow uh, scenario. No, it's not. And and uh, so so Paul Volcker, Volcker, he's the he's the Fed chairman. Mm-hmm. When the United States ended stagflation, uh, what he did was he raised uh, interest rates really high in the face of high employment at that time. So it was early '80s, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's how the United States ended inflation during that period. Uh, yeah, and if you and I remember yeah. Volcker being pretty critical of Greenspan and, and Bernanke down the line, but uh, yeah, I, yeah. As, as as much as anyone can say a Federal Reserve chairman was a good guy, he, he seemed to be one of the better ones. Yeah, yeah, especially with inflation. So, yeah, well, yeah. so, so I think if we ever see some re- return to to moderate inflation, I think the expectation should be that uh, the central banks, you know. You know, as even though they may not know what they're doing right now, with the new environment of zero interest rates, uh, when when stagflation happens again, they sort of know what to do because they've already experienced it before. Um, it's the, this new zero interest rate environment that's really, you know, put, it's making things difficult for people. Um, and uh, so, I mean, that's that's the world we live in, I suppose. So. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I guess a, a lot of the purpose of this discussion is to sort of put to rest this idea that, yeah, you know, the, the wheelbarrow republic is going to return or, or something like that. That in a changing world, there are new economic concerns that take precedence over things, and some ideas mm-hmm. are just outdated. Um, yeah. Such as the Austrian theory of hyperinflation. Yeah. Yeah. So. Which so I think I would just say, throw the baby yeah. out with the bathwater. There are other <laughs> ideas that they have are good. I mean, we we acknowledge that minimum wage laws are, are harmful rather than beneficial. Not that governments mm-hmm. care about that, but I mean, yeah. as far as evidence is concerned, the evidence is on our side. Yeah, and I think I think the argument should be made based on the evidence as well. And one of the problems I have with <laughs> actually the the, lar- sure, the, the, the 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 largest problem that I ever had with Austrian economics was that they don't like empirical analysis. For some reason, it's kind of bizarre. But if you look at some of their writings, it's uh, I think the argument is that empirical um, empirical analysis is not convincing. So therefore, 
it's not worthwhile. I think that that was the argument, if I remember correctly, that that was sort of the argument that I got. And I think that's that's the one thing that I really could accept from from Austrian sort of. Well, I, I, I have people. a theory as to why that's the case, if uh, I might offer it. I think yeah. Austrian economics is an extension of Austrian political thought. It's it's kind of one and the same. You can't really divorce the, the, the libertarianism, strict individualism, the economic policies. They go hand in hand. Now. It's very uh, ideologically charged. It's very uh, sort of philosophical. And yeah. anytime you get something that's ideologically charged and philosophical, in my experience, it tends to want to veer away from from hard empirical data because yeah. the potential risk it runs then is it runs up against data that, that seem to uh, contradict or counter some argument. Uh, yeah. And that that is uh, that's a risk, particularly if you're if you're you're uh, you're really invested in a, in a political or an economic uh, theory. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, to have to revise that, particularly if you spent a lot of time invested in it. Well, that's difficult. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I agree. So if you if you spent like years kind of theorizing and think philosophizing over this theory. Um, I mean, I can see why you don't like empirical analysis, but but I think the the it's really important to to try to look, have sort of a um, data based argument, um, sort of a social experiment based argument on whether or not something is good or something is bad. Um, now I see the Austrians make actually they rely on a lot of, a lot on historical scenarios as well, but they just don't like. The econometric type of data analysis, I suppose, it's just uh, they don't like it. Yeah, I mean, certainly there's a place for both, but uh, yeah. you know, back on your point that you know you think evidence, you know, of course is relevant. Of course, evidence is relevant, but once again, people just don't care about that. Um, yeah, governments don't care about it. Like I said, you could have a worldwide consensus of economists from every country <laughs> in the world come up with an yeah. idea. So, you know, we studied this. You know, we've included 200 years of economic history. It wouldn't matter. The government said, so you should implement this policy. And the government said, well, we can't because our constituency and uh, our voters wouldn't like that, so forget about it. it, it yeah. It's, um, and this is the problem, I think, whether you're a social scientist or a you know, natural scientist, mm -hmm. whatever evidence you gather, it's not going to matter to the politician unless that evidence somehow works in his favor and getting him in, into office or maintaining his office. It's, uh, yeah. it's one of those situations. I, I mean, I think, I think with minimum wage, uh, you have data and experiments to, to an extent where it might be possible to try to convince someone, or if you can't convince someone, you can actually try to make them shut up about a particular topic. Uh, with something related to macroeconomics like inflation, um, it's actually very difficult to to kind of parse out causal causal effects from the data. Uh, so inherently, a lot of the analysis is is um, based on models, even though they're mathematical, um, and and use some data. I mean, they they use some data, but it's not uh, it's not data driven. It's not possible to make it um, as data driven as you can with something like minimum wage. So I think with minimum wage, I, I'm actually, I, I do see a possibility where, where people can be convinced. If you run a lot of these Seattle experiments, um, some point during the, along the line, I think you might be able to convince enough people. Uh, I think the New York Times, I think the New York Times even admitted that, you know, it didn't work, doesn't look to be too great in Seattle, I think. Um, yeah, but the New so York Times. That's, that's an achievement. Yeah, it is a, yeah. A, a mouthpiece for propaganda. That's true. Uh, well, I guess if you did a mass study in the United States of every major city in every state, and maybe, yeah. but uh, there's just there's just too much ideological investment in something like minimum wage, and uh, yeah, like it's like the welfare state is is definitely been well. It, I guess it depends, but and, uh, for certain certain aspects of society uh negative it's been uh, a net negative rather than net plus but you know people argue for its necessity i mean look at now i've seen these economists argue against a guy like thomas Sowell about the welfare state this was 30 years ago and then thomas yeah. Sowell asked the question well how long 
how long do you want to tr- continue running this experiment? And the guy said, well, maybe another 20 or 30 years. Well, now it's been going for six or seven decades, practically, well, yeah. well closer yeah. to six. Um, and, uh, you know, there's been no real change. Uh, and mm. we know, for example, the effects it has and, you know, single single motherhood and all this other stuff. It's just, I'm not, sh- I'm, I'm just not convinced that governments and the people that make up governments and even your average person cares really much about empirical evidence. They might care, the average person might care about what sounds good. Um, yeah. So you, you get that sort of critical mass, that number, whatever it might be. And then they all say, yeah, think- yeah, that's cool. No minimum wage. Oh, yeah, I'm convinced. And then, then the politicians react, oh, okay, the constituency now, they think that minimum wage laws are bad. We need to repeal this. That's probably the only way it would happen. It's not going to be because people really think about it and look at the analyses, you know. Yeah, oh, but I think it's 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 it might work in the sense that you could form uh, rhetorical arguments based off. So if you let's say, I mean, if this isn't the case, but let's say most economists agree that minimum wage is bad, for example, mm. um, then you could form like rhetorical arguments saying, you know, you could argue for authority. You know, people that know something say, you know, this is bad. Uh, for example, something like that. Um, well, it, it really comes down. I mean, th- yeah. there are two issues. Or science here. says. Or <laughs> yeah, science I mean, says. There are two issues here. Um, yeah. The first issue is you're a really smart guy, and so it's always a, a flaw in smart people to think that dumb people are amenable to arguments, and you can sort of you know yeah. reason with them. So that's one issue. The other yeah. issue, I think, is that there are only certain types of arguments from authority that really work with people. Um, yeah. and it needs, it, it's a bit like a, a Coltane recently put out a video where he talks about the, the necessity of technology and how it needs to work with human nature. I think authoritarian arguments or arguments in general need to work with human nature too. And it's human nature to want free shit and it's human nature to want, you know, an, an easy life rather than have to, to work for it because, you know, it's just the way people are. We, uh, that's how we evolve. So to argue that yeah, minimum wage is harmful for all sorts of reasons, um, uh, lack of economic opportunities, blah, 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 that's just not going to resonate with people in the same way as, as, as something, well, we're trying to help you because minimum wage gives you a better standard of living. I mean, that's just not how people operate. So I, I don't ever see that changing. Well, not ever. I don't see it changing anytime soon just because people people are dumb and people don't really care about evidence they don't uh yeah. and even when they, when there is evidence uh, that they agree to it's because it, it somehow coincides or um fits in with their uh with their with their nature and 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 because you know people are going to say oh that sounds good i'm going to be paid three dollars an hour i mean, <laughs> want that they're not going to agree to that yeah i think yeah i mean so i i agree with you um it's uh I mean, I think there's there's a stage. I think I'm I'm slowly entering the stage in life where uh, I don't I, I don't I no longer believe it's possible to convince the majority of people on anything. Actually, um, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure as a Korean, you you and having lived spent so much time in the United States, you've seen many of the flaws in Korean society. But uh, <laughs> I bet. Uh, You'd be hard pressed to convince Koreans of the problems, because uh, it's, yeah, it's not going to work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it, oh, actually, with with regard to inflation, um, there is something interesting. Hmm. So there's a bunch of uh, so I've engaged in a lot of internet arguments arguments in Korean websites about minimum wage. Really? Actually, so the Korean, Korean minimum so the Korean minimum wage was a couple yesterday was raised. Uh, the new president. Remember, the Koreans elected a leftist president. Yeah. Um, and the new president uh, raised the minimum wage, or he, he instructed his minions to uh, raise the minimum wage to 7,351. So that's, that's almost $7 now. Yeah. So, so for an economy like Korea to approach, like have minimum wage that's kind of approaching $7, um, and remember, the United States, you know, it's about the, the average income for the United States is about twice as high as Korea, I think, or more than twice as high. And it's minimum wage. I mean, excluding cities like Seattle, nationwide, it's 
somewhere around seven to eight dollars, right? So, uh, yeah. So the, it's it's been raised in Korea. So I've had this arguments with people um, initially when when I, I I've tried a lot of rhetoric. I, I've tried some arguments uh, when initially when I try to say, well, if you raise the minimum wage, um, uh, employment goes down. So that was my argument. So if you you can raise the minimum wage, it's just that the employment goes goes down. Uh, I think initially. I was met with the reaction, you don't know what you're talking about. You only, uh, you only, took, you only, you only read the uh, principle of the economics book, and you need to read more advanced texts, or you need to know more about economics. Or, or in other cases, they would try to tell me, well, you know, that's what you probably learned in basic economics, but uh, if, you, if you actually, the, the academics think, the recent academic studies have shown that actually minimum wages don't affect um, Employment, or to have a beneficial effect, actually, um, and it's it's really hard. I mean, like you like you pointed out, it's really hard to argue. Um, yeah, especially on the internet. What's actually what's more actually effective is if, if they if they tell me like you know academics say I can tell them well you know I, I'm in that field uh, of academics and, and they immediately shut up actually. Well, I think if anything, Korean society and culture would be more amenable to authoritarian arguments because let's face it, it's extremely collectivist. It's extremely you know you know follow follow whatever the elders say. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, if you come up with a with a good argument, and that argument were represented by, uh, you know, for example, if um, I guess what's his name again, um, Moon Moon Jae-in, Moon Jae-in. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. right. That's the president. So, if Mister Mister Moon um, or President Moon said, "Look, uh, I've done rigorous study now, and it seems that the minimum wage is a, is a bad idea. Here's the consensus, the experts." I think Korean people more than, than many people, certainly more than your typical American, would be more convinced of authoritarian arguments. Oh, well, we should change that. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, I, but in general, especially on the internet, people aren't people aren't interested in people aren't interested in having debates, winning arguments. They're just kind of interested in listening to themselves, and they're not interested in learning yeah. for that matter either. So uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, and uh, I've seen this actually. There's there's been an increase of people that are. Uh, concerned about the recent change in minimum wage, and I've tried to kind of locate why this change in opinion happened. Because usually, what would happen is because a lot of people in my generation are so leftist. Um, whenever I say something like slightly libertarian, people, you know, people tell me, you know, I'm crazy or I don't know what I'm talking about. But in this case, the minimum wage, there actually has been a small change in um, in in the perception of it, at least from from the you know, the, the discussion mm-hmm. forums that I've been attending. Um, and I think one of the, one of the issues was that one of, there's like this leftist uh, podcast that people listen to. And apparently somebody was on there and this person said that actually minimum wage isn't uh, that great for employment, according to recent academic studies. And that apparently had an effect because he was, a he was on their side. So supposedly he, he's like a leftist person that said that. So I think that had more of a, um, effect, and then I also see a lot of people, um, people that I, I think people just. Uh, this is also a case of people voting with their self-interest. I, I see a lot of people who are self-employed or who hire minimum wage workers. Uh, as this share of people increase, I think these people seem to be opposed to it. I, it's purely based off of their personal interest in that case. Yeah. So that. That was a reason. So that was a reason that I, I sensed sort of a change in sort of the internet opinion. But is from, it from the general tide? And I mean, you mentioned that uh, uh-huh. President Moon is is left leaning. I mean, in general, East Asia seems to be moving more and more to the left in terms of you know worldview and all yeah. the things that that seem to have uh, taken place over the previous decades in the West are now arriving there as well. It seems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think. Uh, I mean, I don't know if it's a trend that East Asia is partic- participating in, or or they're just copying off the West, and this is something they're just copying off a decade or two later on, so we're just catching up. I, I think uh, it's both, maybe. I think that, that that human beings, you know, there's a spectrum, right? And, and we know there there this isn't well studied, but we know that people's brains, depending on their politics, have different structures, and so there's a spectrum, but. 
human beings, I think, on average, are probably more left leaning than they are right because uh-huh. uh, right leaning arguments. And I, it's so difficult to find you know what's right, what's left these days. But I guess there's a vague consensus to what that means. Yeah, don't appeal to the you know the, the softness of, of human nature. It doesn't make people feel good. To, you know to to hear something like, well, you know, three bucks an hour, you know, or, you know, we need to, for example, to preserve uh, the integrity of, of you know, the European um, a European country, you know, we need to limit immigration or whatever. I mean, it doesn't really matter. Um, that stuff doesn't sound good to people. It makes them feel icky and sort of evil. Left stuff, yeah. just it makes people feel good. And particularly oh, yeah. women, women overwhelmingly uh, tend to be leftists. Um, the yeah. ones that aren't are either exceptions or they're married and their husband pays <laughs> their bills exce- uh, with no exception. Um, yeah. So I think there is a general tendency uh, to just sort of move towards the left. I mean, there's that, that old sort of saying, you know, anything that's not explicitly right, you know, was, but, and, and, you know, to be fair, there are things that are wrong about the right too. But it's just, I do, I see this as a kind of inevitable thing about human nature. So, there there are stop gaps in a place like South Korea because of the long Confucian tradition. Uh-huh. But I see that in time being eroded. I think I think yeah. in twenty or thirty years, um, you know, you're gonna. Who knows? I mean, I, this is a crazy prediction, but. You know, you might walk up to an elder and say "onion" or something like that, right? <laughs> uh, you know, who knows? I mean, so 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 um, Confucian. So people who who don't know that much about Confucianism, one of the characteristics of Confucianism is that it's uh, rel- it's pretty secular, actually. Yeah. Um, with regard to its ideolo- ideology, it's uh, so I think one of the reasons why East Asians, I mean, various reasons. There's a lot of reasons why East Asian societies were able to. Uh, accept Western ideas and uh, improve their economies was that you know Confucianism kind of committed suicide pretty pretty quickly. So yeah. once once people uh, realized this wasn't the way, um, you know you had you had uh, I think the J- Japan what they did was they forced people to take uh, dress like Western people. I think there was like this dress code imposed. Mm. Um, and they really didn't have any strong. I mean, Confucianism doesn't really give you that that strong of an attachment to tra- tradition, outside of some ritualistic ones. So there's yeah, always yeah, like the honoring the ancestors when you waste yeah, all that yeah. food. Like I never understand. You, you, <laughs> yeah, other than that, just, there, there, it's actually. That, do, you, do you actually yeah. eat that? I'm trying to. You don't eat it, do you? You just the 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 people prepare the food, and then um, you put it in front of a picture and burn incense and. And then you you, you uh, bow so, your, or you get on your knees. So right? our our our, fa- our family ate it. So I don't know how that works. Oh, okay. Um, well, I I, so I was I was, I was uh, okay. So maybe that's that's the right way to do. It. So you 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 worked in a place that's I, probably. Well, I, I had you know I had connections <laughs> yeah. with the Koreans. I had some ex wives, and you know I, I just thought it was strange the way they did it. But I'm hardly in, I'm trying to remember what is that ritual called again in Korean. Oh, chesa. Oh, chesa. Yeah. 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 So. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, but, but yeah, I think that in general that everything that sort of these distinctions are going to kind of just come loose in, in, the, in the ensuing yeah. decades. Like yeah. I said, it wouldn't surprise me if in 30 years, you know, a, a 15-year-old walks up to a 70-year-old and uh, just says, hey, like, you know, <laughs> what's up, dude? Uh, so Yeah, it might be, might be, might be. Yeah, it could yeah. I think it could happen? I think um, I'm not going to be making a separate video on this, but in general, there's an erosion of hierarchy across the globe. But separate topic. Yeah. Anyway, I think. Oh we've, yeah, we've, absolutely. Um, go oh ahead. yeah, never mind. Uh, uh, so when I uh, first went to college in, in South Korea, hmm. um, so in college there's a hierarchy. There's also a hierarchy in college. So it depends on when you entered college. So I think in, in Western countries you have a class of like 2017. That's the people that graduate, right? Yeah. Um, in Korea, what you have is if you're a class of uh, 2017, for example, that's the person that entered the college in 2017. Right. Um, and basically, when I when I went to college, it was actually pretty hierarchical in the sense that um, Korea is also very hierarchical in, in terms of age. 
Well, yeah, um, so, so what happens is you have different uh, language that you're supposed to speak to somebody who's older than you. Nah. But what happened in college was that uh, once you're in this uh, class, um, there isn't, there's not supposed to be, um, there's not supposed to be any sort of, you're supposed to speak to each other like they're in your same age group, age cohort. Um, so even though this person might be one year older than me, uh, he'd still be my sort of like same age, same same age type uh, friend. Um, if that person actually, the, the rules were that, there was actually rules for this. The rule is that if there is actually a person, so he tried to go to college, he took uh, exams, let's say three times, so he's two, old, two years older than me. Uh, and then in that case, we would uh, change the language to respect him. But if he's only one year older than me, then I wouldn't, he's just my friend. And back, so before, before me, actually, if you're on, if you entered the class in the same year, everybody was your friend. Uh, I think this, this culture also changed about like, I think five years after, after I, um, entered college from then what happened was, uh, when you enter college, doesn't matter anymore. Everything depends on age now. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's, that's how the, uh, sort of, uh, hierarchy works within the college type of, uh, culture. So, I mean, there's been these, like, little changes in Korea. So, was, in 30 years, anything can happen. So, we'll see. Yeah, I guess I guess we'll see. Certainly, in the West, hierarchy is uh, disintegrated. And I'm planning on making a separate video on that topic. But, uh, yeah. yeah, I think uh, you've, uh, you've uh, helped us with your expertise on these economic matters. And uh, we've uh, covered uh, the main, well, the, the big issue is sort of the hyperinflation and why that is no longer applicable. Um, so I'm going to thank my guest for joining me today and uh, providing us with his Thank you for having me. And, uh, yeah, and if there are any economic issues that arise in the future, we all know uh, whom we can turn to. So, uh, as they say in, in Korean, 감사합니다. Well, and, thank you. And, uh, yeah, I will uh, probably be getting an amount of time in the future. Thanks for joining me. All right. All right. Thank you. I, If you liked this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you enjoy my content, please consider making a donation or becoming a patron. Thanks for watching.